Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome back. I have Miguel Harth Bedoya with me. Welcome to uh, Off the Podium. Where are you now? I am physically at home in Fort Worth, Texas. Oh, wow. So the big thing uh, about your career recently is the big announcement that you made, and I think it's okay to talk about it now, is your college uh, professor job. Yes, exactly. That's new out to the public, but I've been devoting my time to, to what well, I call it sharing knowledge and experience. Some call it teaching, huh? but to me, it, it has to start with what I've done and what I do and be able to use that uh -huh. as a tool. You know, so uh, basically when I turned 50 years uh -huh. of age a couple of years ago, I felt so much more comfortable finally, because then you can talk about what you have done and uh -huh. what you know rather than what you don't. So many a times I run into things and topics that I don't know about. And I'll just be very honest. I said, I don't know about that one. You should find somebody who knows about that specific thing or that one. So yeah, that's, it's a new stage of my life officially, officially oh. now. And I'm very excited about it. Yeah. So uh, another thing that you've been doing, and I think uh, from, ev and I don't know everyone around the world, but from what I've noticed, you're one of the first people to, during this pandemic, to jump on and do some online seminars, at least one of the first ones that I know. Tell me a little bit about that. And I participated in one, which was fantastic. But tell me a so little bit. What happens, it's all circumstantial. You know, what I do starts with why I do what I do. I never imagined in my life, you know, growing up in Lima, Peru, that I would end up doing the things I do now. But it always was because of music and more importantly, as a non-performer, because my violin and, and piano playing are just really not acceptable. <laughs> So, or singing much less, is loving to, to study somebody else's piece of music. Mm -hmm. So that to me is the beginning. If you don't like doing that, you can't really be a conductor about the music of somebody. You may be a conductor about yourself, but that's, mm -hmm. that's not. So my profession has taken me places and through situations that I never thought. Mm -hmm. And I've always welcomed that from music itself rather than from an industry or, or the business as such. To me, that's, that's only the default or that's how you channel what, what you do. For instance, we always say we work for nonprofit organizations, right? Which we do technically, but then if you think about, we work for something that is not. Right, I'd rather work for, an, for something that is for impact, mm. okay? Music is to create that. So, but it's the same context, it's how, how you phrase what you do. And money is the fuel to get to do that, for instance. And that's where the, the profit, the nonprofit comes into very complicated stages. So, but to get to your answer, I was flying back just about two months ago. It was March 17. I managed to come back into the country from Melbourne. I did, as a matter of fact, the last concert out of three happened without an audience and it was done in a live streaming situation. It was probably one of the first that just happened because we were caught in the middle of it and Australia was far behind cases of COVID-19. So I came in, you know, it's a 15 hour flight at least to LA and it's a double decker full, completely full of people. And so this is recipe for disaster. If we're talking about social distancing, that's not how you start. So we made a plan. Just clear the way and I'll go straight to my room. I'll just wave at you, my wife and kids, and I'll see you in two weeks. That's what we did. Mm -hmm. Because when, when I landed at LA, I'm thinking, okay, at least we're going to get tested. No, forget about it. There were no testing, nothing, nothing. So you're elbow to elbow, shoulder to shoulder with hundreds of people. I mean, thousands probably, you know, once you have multi, these big uh, air carriers that, that, anyway, you can picture. So I, so what am I doing now for two weeks? I'm just thinking and I'm reading and I'm, what can I do that is of use? And suddenly I thought, well, all my concerts were canceled. All of our concerts have been canceled, right? Mm -hmm. So I probably won't be in the podium before September. Who knows if, if beyond. And I realized, well, everything has a positive and a negative. Absolutely everything, the way you want to look at it. And now for conductors, unlike instrumentalists, the non-conducting time, so the downtime is perfect to do what? To study, to learn, to prepare for when we don't have the time. Mm -hmm. Because when we're performing, you have to balance this. Yeah. So instrumentalists have to maintain, obviously, a certain way of practicing, playing, learning, but conductors, we don't have an option to practice. Yeah. So that's when the thought came in. What can I do that is useful also to maintain music as essential? Mm -hmm. Because music has 
been determined as non-essential. Mm -hmm. But I don't believe so. I mean, look at the Italians, right? When they go out to the balconies, when they were in complete lockdown, they would go to the balconies. Were they reciting mathematic equations? No, they were singing. Yeah. So it, music is part of human nature, mm -hmm. any kind of music. So my thinking were around that. Music is essential. So let's get to, so let's just do a talk, a webinar in which people actually can talk because there are, there are a few of these live Facebook or YouTube or Instagram, but you don't have access to the person mm -hmm. or people don't have access to other people. And to me, that's fascinating when in these webinars, you know, that are 60, 70, 80 people, or sometimes 30, question, yes, oh, you are in Finland. Look at that. I mean, somebody is connected and then there's somebody somewhere else and a kid who gets up at six in the morning in New Zealand just to catch a little bit of Augustine Havelik joining. So why not? So that's the long answer to your short question. Yeah. Well, you know, I've had a couple of uh, guests recently who weren't very positive about these live streaming concerts or live things. How, what are your feelings about people live streaming concerts? Because quite a few of them were like, well, we have so many concerts from the past, just share those. There's no need to play in your living room or something. What, what are your feelings about that? Well, do you like fish? I don't know if, you're, if you eat fish. Sure, yeah. Okay, so there's fresh fish and there's canned fish. Canned fish is going to taste the same because it's meant to taste the same, not fresh fish. So it's a completely different thing. It's not that whether you should or you must. It's a completely different thing. Yeah. So now a live stream means there's no going back. Mm -hmm. It only goes forward. So the live performance experience, it's only one way. Yeah. So when I listen to music, which I don't listen to music in general, because I like to reserve that moment as a special moment for me to focus on music wow. rather than while I'm doing something else. I only go forward. I'm not studying. I'm not thinking about, I'm just being taken away by the music forward. Now, if I watch a live performance recorded, it's not live anymore. It's only live the first time that you go forward and you don't stop. And it's also live because the environment of the performance is live. So they don't go back. Rather a different scenario of a recorded piece of music that I'm not saying is bad, but it's just, a different experience mm. and we can apply that question to absolutely everything wow. absolutely everything so why would we want to hear you know the, the un annual speech well listen to the one last year most likely be the same thing so <laughs> it, it's just a matter of how we we think of of life and things that attain to life yeah. simple do i want to go for a walk i already went last year yeah. well <laughs> you know so yeah. i don't have a good answer to that but i mean I think everything is valid if it touches people. I mean, music, particularly music. You cannot touch music, but music can touch you. So you cannot tell somebody how music will or should touch you mm. because that's so personal. And the moment we start telling you should, you shouldn't, you should, then we're actually not doing a favor to music. Well, I was going to you said you don't listen too much, but when you do listen, is there, are, are there, um, artists or pieces or songs that you listen to that are not classical? Oh, a lot, actually. In this all starts, we have three children, and right now they are 18, 15, 14, give or take. And my joy as a, as a father is to spend time with them when I'm at home, at breakfast, first thing, because then everybody goes to schooling and rehearsals and all of that. And picking them up or taking them places like to practice and all of that. That's when I see my kids. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, even if we're at home, like they're schooling right now, I don't see them. Mm -hmm. So I let them handle the radio. Wow. Oh yes. And it's a double joy because I get to know them and I get to hear music. So name anything. I mean, from, for instance, when, when Maroon 5, which is now a long time ago, you know, or Imagine Dragons, or, or Adele, or Ariana Grande, or the rappers. I mean, absolutely everything. And mm -hmm. I, I let them choose it. So I don't ever say we should listen to this. However, lately with my wife, we have had this routine that on Friday night, when everything is quiet down, now because I don't have concerts, I never had a Friday night quiet. Mm -hmm. So we have been looking for live performances, on the internet of something. 
Huh. And as long as it's live and we don't interrupt and we don't let our kids interrupt and we just say, listen, we're going to enjoy a performance. And of course, there's a limitation because in a live performance, I get to choose what I want to see mm. while listening. Fine. It's not the perfect world. It's still great. So I, I just sort of let the camera director take me. But something, oh, I wish I had seen one more, yeah. one more second of, of, of that or of this. So, yeah, we, we're, we're doing that. And it's an experience that counts. We never have background music. Why? Can you imagine background poetry? <laughs> it's the same thing. <laughs> You'll be listening to isolated words. <laughs> no, it's great. Actually, when people say why you should listen to music live, one of the points you made is a point I rarely hear, which is I don't choose to, uh, you know, watch the moments because the director, when you're watching a concert online, the, the, the cameraman decides what you see. But that's that's a great point, because in, in the live performance, that's another great thing about the live performance is you is you decide if you want to look at the performers or just look down and uh, or look at a different part for a long time so that's the, that's that's a great point that's that's a good way of saying it i, I was going to ask you about your mentors you had some great mentors um uh, who have influenced your life why don't you say a little bit about them and what they've done for you well my first mentor was really my only teacher otto werner Mueller, who taught at the Curtis Institute of Music, where I did my undergrad studies in orchestral conducting. Still people think that that never happened in life. Yes, I spent a degree in orchestral conducting, and then I did a second degree in orchestral conducting, also with him at Juilliard. Now, it was very clear because on my very first lesson, he made it clear that I knew, I was 19, that I didn't know anything about music. And he obviously, you know, Western music. And he was totally right. Why, why should I know any music? So that fascinated me, the fact that I would have a teacher that would know me better than me. Mm. And that's a mentor and somebody that knows you more than yourself and then can tell you things openly. The good and the not so good. So he was extremely helpful to me in, in, in many, many aspects, not only in teaching me. Again, what is teaching? No, he guided me. Literally, he guided me through all the hoops and the ups and downs of what I didn't know. And then when I entered the pro profession, literally, as soon as I graduated from Juilliard, I became one of the assistant conductors of the New York Philharmonic. And Kurt Mazur had just started his tenure. This is in 91. And I spent four years under his tutelage. And as assistant conductor, really, my main job was to continue learning or be prepared if needed which was great. Now that changes in different orchestras in which assistants con assistant conductors have specific jobs and duties. But way back, I mean, it was unimaginable that you would finish school and no repertoire. Because how, even though my repertoire was quite large at that point, when you enter to work with an orchestra like the New York Philharmonic, every week is at least one different program. So if you don't know already 80% of that, you're not going to make it. You're going to be left behind. Throughout. So th this, this to two individuals helped me understand music. I mean, they may not have done anything specifically to say, here, I launched your career, or not really, but the lessons in life and music were so much greater. And I still go back to, to those thoughts and those lessons, and I use them as tools that I can self-help myself. Mm. And the bachelor's degree, you mentioned a bachelor's degree in conducting. There, there are very few schools around the country that, uh, especially in the U.S., that have Chapman University is one of them from what I... Yes, not, and, there's, and there's a second on the East Coast. Uh, you, you're going to launch a program that's a bachelor's. Yes. <clears throat> What's the importance of a bachelor's degree and why well, should other programs have it? Well, Man School of Music never lost it. They've had it always since forever. Interesting. Okay, I didn't... But, know. I, but in the 20th century, so last century, which is the generation that I'm in, that I'm from, <clears throat> look at this. You spend the longest time in a subject at the undergrad level. So just do the math. If you start at a master's degree, you can be done officially in two years, but you have learned half or less of what's required from a specialty point of view. Apply this to the reverse, to absolutely any instrument. I want to be a violinist. Okay, but do your degree in biology for four years or maybe in, in, in a Baroque flute. Okay. And then you only will study two years and you'll get a diploma. Now, does that make sense? Yeah, that's true. So uh, the, the, the point being is that if conducting is understood as moving your hands, 
Sure, you can learn that in a week. But the question is, the about what you are conducting, that takes years. I mean, just to get through literature, music literature. So my point being is that if you don't, if you step out of school without knowing the orchestral repertoire, that to me, you have not been trained as a conductor. Hmm. Now, not only the literature, what about languages? If you, if you want to do operas or oratorios or cantatas or arias or songs in other languages, you'll be way behind. Or if you, was, if you start later, but I mean, there's no, no late. Just don't pretend that you'll, be, you'll get somewhere quicker. Yeah. Okay, what about instruments? I mean, I, I spend five, six semesters at least going through the training of many instruments. I had a whole semester on harp pedaling, on trombone, sometimes just on trombone slides and things like that. Mm. So you can't pretend. So what I, my, my, two words, no shortcuts. Mm. And to me, starting at a master's degree, it's a shortcut. Wow, yeah. To me, absolutely. Unless, see, there's the argument. Sure, you can study all kinds of things. It'll be helpful for it. Yes, but not necessarily. For instance, I can give you two examples of two things that are things you can study at any degree and are completely useless once you're on the podium. One is movable though. There's absolutely no use once you're in the podium because if you say, may, that's a may. And people look at you, well, you shouldn't be conducting because you have no idea. So, but you can devote hours to learn that. No problem if you have the extra time. I can do it, but I never use it. Or Schenkerian analysis, which I've also taken. But those things don't apply to become a conductor. Mm. I've studied then when I had the extra time to add a layer. So adding layers is different than building from so much that you don't know what's your foundation. Mm. That to me is as simple as it is. It's baking a cake. What takes more time, baking the cake or putting the cherry on top of the cake? The cherry is the easiest. Open the jar. And actually, in one second, it's gone. You eat it. But try baking the cake. It's messy. Yeah. It takes practice. It takes over and over. You burn it. It's the same thing. Why, why do we want to do it quicker? I don't get the point. Yeah. What, what is the rush? Is yeah. it a drive-through of studying type style? That's great. That, those are all good points. Um, you know, uh, changing gears a little bit, uh, I've been, uh, one of my standard questions with all my guests has been a, a life-changing moment. And quite a few of them said, oh, well, uh, personal and musical uh, are, are different. So I ask you a personal, maybe a life-changing moment and a musical life-changing moment. The life-changing moment was to see the birth of our first child, of our daughter. Because you can hear about it, but the beginning of life itself, well, or, or watching, you know, physically, that is to me an unbelievable uh, experience. But not only the fact of it, it's suddenly the, the feeling that you are part of human creation yeah. and you have a responsibility. Mm -hmm. If you want to have a responsibility, because you can't say this is how it's for everybody. But to me, that was an amazing you know, life-changing experience. But it only happens the first time. Yeah. There's only one first time. There's no second first time. All right. And the other one was in music. Uh -huh. Oh, there are way too many, too many firsts. <laughs> <laughs> but actually, the, the, the real life changing experience was before I studied conducting. Uh -huh. Because I, I had just finished high school in Lima. And I, by then, I was already working part-time as backstage crew for the theater in Lima, which did opera productions, modest, but operas nonetheless, mainly Italian operas. So in, in this particular instance, we were doing Tosca. Mm. And of course, we never get to see the performances because we're backstage. So in this particular last set of what you call dress rehearsals or full rehearsals, you know, with, with staging, maybe not costumes, but with orchestra, not quite a vandal probably either. But anyway, so I was done with my, with, with my duties. Because for the Te Deum, at the end of Act One of Tosca, everything was ready to go. I didn't have to cue the chorus. I had to just make sure that the curtain would, would close up on cue. So in all theaters, you would have a, a bridge, an actual bridge over the pit, so that you would just literally jump from the stage into the house to make it quicker instead of going up and down and through back channels. So I did that to just watch, you know, for once, watch this, this scene. And, and the conductor who had seen me just because we hang around and you know, we were at the cafeteria and, and, and I move the chairs and the desks, just turned around and said, hey, Miguel, can you conduct this for me so that I can hear it? 
And either out of ignorance or boldness, but I think ignorance more, I said, sure, of course. In the sense that, I mean, we have, re we have been rehearsing this for what, three weeks, right? I mean, what, what, what is there not to know? But except that I've never conducted an orchestra like this. So I don't know how long the, the Te Deum lasts, maybe five minutes, four minutes. And it just happened and it went and it went and done. And to realize I can do this. In other words, I, in, I can get to do this. And that was a triggering moment to me that really led me to look for where, now where, because we didn't have a music school in Peru. So had not been for that experience, the, the generosity, not only of this conductor, maybe unwanted, or, and, and the musicians who, you know, they could have rebelled as well. But basically they knew me first as a person because I had been around them for, you know, two, three years. Yeah. So yeah, and probably I wouldn't be, I wouldn't have, you know, chosen to, to look for where to study if it hadn't been for that experience. Oh, well, uh, you know, a lot of musicians, it's not an easy path to get to where you are or get to wherever people are in their careers, the ones that are successful. What advice would you give to young musicians struggling and trying to make it happen as a career in, in music? First of all, in no particular order, hard work. You cannot get places without hard work. It's like a good athlete. I mean, and a good athlete would work so hard to beat one second of their last performance, right? Because it has to be in the nature of wanting to excel yourself. And that only can be done through hard work. Let's put it that way. I cannot have a better say than that. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't get easier, but you have to love that particular aspect of, of, of being a conductor. The other one is you have to be yourself. Mm -hmm. You can't pretend to be someone else, meaning yeah, I want to conduct like that person. Well, you're not conducting like that person. You think you appear to look like that person, but you're a second-rate bad copy of that person because the, what's inside the person is what you don't know. And, and conducting really is what comes from the inside through the outside. So just be yourself. If you are yourself and you, are, and you work hard at the level, at the place, at the time you are at, and you try to be your best today, and be better tomorrow than the day before. Mm -hmm. That's all, it's not perfection, I'm not perfect, but I try to apply this. And it gets harder when an orchestra knows you more, mm -hmm. whether you're a music director or you're a recurrent guest conductor, because they expect you to be better than you. Mm -hmm. And you cannot make things up. Mm -hmm. You cannot not be you, and you cannot not work hard, it's yeah. simple. But it's exciting, I mean, I, I, I get excited about those challenges, I never tell, I make it clear that it's not easy, but for the good reasons. This is exciting, good. As a matter of fact, no profession is easy as far as I know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, uh, you mentioned Peru. I, I, I think you're the first person from Peru that I've actually had on this podcast and I've done a hundred and I don't know too many Peruvian musicians. Uh, how, how is the musical world in Peru, specifically Western music, orchestral maybe? And uh, do you still keep in touch and do you still work there? I've been back to Peru pretty much every year since the last, since 88. So that's way over 30 years now. And I have to say that, I mean, Peru, it's, a, it's an extremely rich country in music. Now, it may not be in Western music, but we have had music for millennia. Mm -hmm. We sing, we dance, and we have all types of music, either from the coast regions, from the Andes, from pre-Columbian music to Baroque music once the Spanish came in and so on and so forth. There was a hype in South America because of the great wars and, and musicians migrating or leaving Europe or, or the, and the Soviet Union. And that b vanished later when, when Europe and the Soviet Union or Russia started moving up. So there was this exodus of, of musicians. So there, there were some high moments, but this is before I was born, you know, in the 50s, in the 60s, and then a bit in the 70s, I suppose. So we, we're trying to you know, goes one step at a time. But there have been some great performers. I mean, recently Juan Diego Flores in the field of, of opera, Jimmy Lopez in, in composition, who recently has been, you know, composer in residence for the Houston Symphony. Uh, the, the, yeah, there are some great pianists here and there, but we don't produce them in, in mass, mm -hmm. just also because of our, our system. But at the same time, there's a question, music is music. So if there are lots of musicians doing music, that's still a great thing. And I find that Peru has that richness. In music uh, everywhere yeah it may not be 
symphonic music, but there is music. Yeah. And now the movement of youth orchestras has picked up, which is, which is good. So I, I say now that the 21st century is the turn for Latin America. Yeah. You know, there are less dictatorships or none, really, is this, well, depends. And <laughs> so it's a, yeah, it, it, it has to do all of it. You know, it's, it's, all, it's, it's all a complex yeah. situation. You, know, you, have, you have freedom of, of expression that, that, that goes with music because mm -hmm. music is a, a very strong form of expression without words many a times. Yeah. And uh, you've done many premieres and especially you're very passionate about Latin American repertoire and composers. Uh, what's the importance of premieres? Uh, you know, there's so much music from hundreds of years ago. What's the importance of premieres and what gets you excited and nervous about premieres? Let's look at this differently. So go back 200 years plus. Mm -hmm. What is it? Beethoven's time, right? Can you imagine if then this question would have been asked and everybody would say the same thing. Oh, we don't need any more music. Mm -hmm. There's plenty of music already, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. So there would be any Beethoven, any Brahms, any Tchaikovsky, any Bruckner, any, keep going. Yeah. So that's the question. Why would you stop it? Mm -hmm. Because you don't know. With new music, the birth of a child, you don't know what is going to come out as a, as a piece of art. So mm -hmm. the question should be that way. Why would you stop doing it? Because this is part of the human legacy. So, uh, first of all, then you have to enjoy doing it. Yeah. Letting it happen is one thing, and then enjoy doing it. Now, it's a different process because you may not know what you're getting into if you're receiving a brand new piece. So, but that's part of the, that's part of the challenge, but the, the beauty. And I just love, again, is, is that there's only one first time, and I like first times. I've done many first world premiere recordings, and there can only be only one first time. There's no second first time. So to me, there is a value and a challenge because if you get it wrong, well, you know, you shouldn't get it. Yeah. You know. So the, the, the question of Latin American music, first of all, there's no Latin American music as such because there's no genre called Latin American music. Is when we refer to Spanish, mm -hmm. is if you speak Spanish, well, no, I don't speak Spanish. I speak Castilian because Spanish is a citizenship. It's not a language. We don't speak American. So, but these are terms that get put by others. Mm -hmm. But it's totally fine because I, at least I like that people know whereabouts we're talking about. Yeah. I like to call it the music of the Americas because okay. don't forget about Canada. There's a big country up there that we, <laughs> we don't take for granted. I mean, you know, there are composers there too. Yeah. So I like all the Americas. I just like this axis that throughout time was not connected because of the Panama Isthmus and it's still... You know, debatable whether the cultures met up and down and the ones that came from north and the ones that came from south and i think over millennia they have produced amazing works of art not only in music but in textile and ceramics and, and so on and so forth uh, literature so I, I think by now because it's still the young continent australia is younger i mean australasia or Oce oceania I think there's enough wealth right now to not share it. And it was Yo-Yo Ma who always pushed me you know, when I started working also with the Silk Road and said, you've got to do something. Well, not really. I don't have to do something. But yes, you have to do something in the sense that you can just be the, the door, the gateway, and let others follow suit. So, and also this was a great part of my learning in the profession in which relationships do matter but the real valid relationship not necessarily the business relationship and for instance the chicago symphony in one of my visits which wasn't my first uh, they, they had a theme that had to do with the world geography they weren't too sure and and i said well i've been thinking about this particular you know program because of you and and yo, -Yo and i had just performed at ravinia the year before or two years before and about the equivalent of the Silk Road, but the Inca trails and maybe there. Okay, done. Well, it's not done. I don't have the program. Yeah, it's done. It's whatever you want. And, but it'll take, that's fine. This is whatever you want. And actually, the Chicago Symphony said, whatever I want. And I said, wow, really? And so now I'm not thinking it's whatever I want. Is they're really opening the door to whatever I think it should be valid. And once that was done there, of course, the Boston Symphony said, oh, yeah, sure. And the Philadelphia, Orchestra, that's a no-brainer and the LA Philharmonic and the Seattle Symphony and, and then in Europe and then in Asia is just because the concept and the idea can help 
the musical content. Yeah. We live in a world that lack of knowledge of specifics or too much information about everything else prevents knowing something. Yeah. So the only way I could do this effectively was to give a context. So when you talk about Caminos del Inca, well, if you don't really know that Brazil, Uruguay, Paraguay were never part of the Inca trails, but you get the point that it's there and, and you can do, you know, the Eastern part of the, of the Inca trails or things like that. You know, I, I want to do the Incas meet the Mayans. Oh. Why not? I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a poetic way of, of connecting music to, to people. So, but at the same time, the fact that I'm Peruvian doesn't make me an expert on Chilean music or Bolivian or Ecuador, or none whatsoever. So I had to study every genre, the history of music of every country before I would embark into doing any of their music, because then I would be doing them halfway through. Wow. That's amazing. And it's, it's great to see that you're so passionate about premieres because I feel the same way you do. I think it should be done. And, and, uh, you know, and, and people learn it's the great thing about this is that when you come back to a piece, you've premiered it and then you come back to it again and you do it. So it's really become, you give people a chance to hear it a few times because sometimes things are done and you premiere something, but then you don't go back to it. And it's always great to go back and do it again and learn from it too. Um, you're, a, you're passionate and you, basically have another job in a completely different field. Uh, you're an environmental advocate and you have another, another thing, which was so uh, great to, to see. I, I can't believe it. Can you share a little bit about what you do? Well, you're referring to cowboy compost. Yes. Right. So this started just as a normal citizen. And because we have lived in different countries, we have lived in New Zealand as well. We have lived in different parts of the United States not only New York City, but also Eugene, Oregon, you know, granola country. And, and then I've been working in Norway for seven years. So you realize that sustainability and your environment is part of who we are, definitely. So the city of Fort Worth was running into major issues because the city of Fort Worth was a few months ago, the number 13th in size of population in the country. More population than Atlanta and Boston, really. So, but with more population, you have other issues that grow. You know, more traffic or more pollution and more garbage. Hmm. And because we are in, in, in a city that there's a lot of freedom of business, so there's very regulations of things to, to, or, to maintain things in order. It is the thought that good citizenship will drive these things rather than laws or... Anyway, the bottom line is that we were producing so much garbage that at one point we were not going to have anywhere to put our garbage. So diverting things from the landfill was the only mission and of all the services that one could find in the entire city nobody offered organic recycling in other words take food scraps or organic matter to be composted and then put back in and so a friend of, of of mine and i decided to look into this and started with just a few things a few buckets uh, and and now it's a company and we want a contract for the city of fort worth now because uh, having in other words, when there's something missing, you can complain about it. But if you don't bring an idea forth and execute it, then you shouldn't be complaining about it. So, and we are starting this at the, high, at the school level so that this is part of a habit more than you must. Yeah. You know? It's like, like rehearsing an orchestra. You can tell you must play like this. Yeah, but if you don't tell them why or give them a context, they may not be compelled to do it. Yeah. They might do it, but they may not be engaged to do it. So it's a little bit... Like that, and I had to learn a lot, a lot of things, but I have a, a business partner that that uh, that does that that part of the company. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, one last question: is, uh, hobbies. What what do your the fans, the followers that you have? Uh, is there something that they don't know about you that you're willing to share with us, or most people don't know that you're willing to share with us? Well, my hobbies have been adapting over life, so that I can do them with the family. Mm -hmm. I used to run, but when I turned forty. My joints were telling me, you should stop running if you want to conduct standing up for the next, the rest of your life. So, you know, I changed that to long walks. And when I do long walks, I listen to podcasts. Mm -hmm. Yes. So I would walk according to the length of the podcast. If it's an hour and 15 or 30, I would you know, do this everywhere, wherever I am. So I, I found that joy. In, in terms of a physical activity, fly fishing, mm -hmm. which is not so easy to, to find, but it's quiet also. You know, you cannot do that in group. But lately, we have been into board games yeah. with the kids because since we're confined, we have to adapt. Yeah. So I, I've been shifting based, based on, on, on the purpose of a hobby. 
rather than be in isolated. So, so I have one isolated one that walk with it. But if I walk with the family, I won't be listening to music. So it goes along those lines, nothing fancy, nothing complicated. I don't fly planes or sail, you know. <laughs> well, that's great. Thanks, thanks so much for joining me. Is there anything else you want to add before we leave here? Well, I realized that in, in the very first question, we didn't say where I was going to teach. So I'm, I'm, joining, I'm joining the University of Nebraska in Omaha School of Music as Director of Orchestral Studies. And, and believe it or not, I've already gotten requests from sophomores and juniors in high school just wanting to know how they should prepare if they choose to apply for, for an undergrad in orchestral conducting, which is great. And I haven't even started. Yeah. So that tells me that there has always been the need for the ones that, that want it. And, and it's a sort of unusual for someone who is at your level conducting some great orchestras to take on a position like this because it requires a lot of work. I mean, what's, what, uh, the balance must be tough, you know, and plus family. So you're, we'll you find out. The, we'll yeah. find out. I, have, I haven't started yet, but yeah. as long as there's a balance, I think there are two things that you should not negotiate with. One is sleep every day. Mm -hmm. You cannot put off sleep for a month and eat well. But eating well is whatever is good for you. So if you keep those two things, then you'll be in at least a, a physical and mental shape to undertake projects. I also say no to a lot of things because I've come to learn that there's a limitation of, of time and, and skills as well. You know, I cannot do anything. But, but also the conducting institute that was supposed to be just a gateway for beginners. I'm interested in the beginners, in the fundamentals, because if we don't invest there, Undoing and relearning is just not a fun thing, fun thing to do. So when you're saying you cannot imagine doing this, I can imagine it absolutely, you yeah. know, to start from scratch. It's actually much easier to teach somebody from scratch because you just go upwards or forward. Yeah, yeah. There's no, no backwards uh, to go to. So, yeah, we'll just find out how it works. But I'm, I'm actually committing in enough weeks to, to teach if, if I wouldn't commit. So this is not an appointment in name, that my name is going to be there and I'm not going to show up there under any circumstances. So that means that my guest, now that I'm not music director of any orchestra, and it was also part of a plan, I had to free myself up because you can't be adding things. Yeah. So I knew that when my 20-year my tenure would, would finish, and I knew that two years ago, you know, starting mapping out that you're putting the time available to do different things as well. Wow. Well, I, I've asked this question of some, some people, and I, uh, I know I said last question, but one more. What's a project? What's a piece? What's a composer? A solo is something that you have in the back of your mind. Like, I really want to do that collaboration, that piece one more time, and you have not done it yet. What's one project? Well, the one project that I would have done it, so now I have the same feeling. There were two projects. I was going to do both Bach's Passions this year for the first time in my life. Wow. I put them off for decades. And I was going to do the St. John Passion over Easter and that with, with, with the Forward Symphony musicians, so which is very small groups and chamber choir. And the St. Matthew Passion, I was to do it this coming July at the Oregon Bach Festival with a Baroque orchestra. Wow. So I would have done them back to back. So now at least the, the St. Matthew Passion has been postponed for another year. So that's still, because I didn't get to do either of them, that's still something that I'm looking forward to, to doing it, particularly because I've put them, put them off for decades, mm. decades. You know, I've known these pieces, and every time I look at them, I say, no, it's too hard. I'm not good enough to, to understand this and do this. Many times the conductor is on the way of music, rather than this is too hard at a different level. So no on wood, I'll, I'll get at least half of my wish list done next wow. year. That's amazing. Okay, well, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a pleasure. Have a beautiful day. And I hope one day maybe we could do this in person. Absolutely. It would be great to meet you in person. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Let's Talk Off the Podium. If you enjoyed this episode, please comment, share, and subscribe. Stay tuned for the next episode.